Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video. Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of the Eating Crow podcast. I have on the show today, the first time I've done a three-person podcast, I have Jane and Guy Harvey. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So you guys are calling in from where? Ontario, Canada. Boy, it's cold up there. Too cold. It's not too bad. (laughs) It's not too bad today. Well, it's April, right? You'd think it should be better. Yes. So uh, I, I met uh, Guy and Jane through uh, my day job at Sabo, um, and their story is one of the more remarkable stories I've heard. So I asked if they would mind being on the podcast to share it. Um, it's extremely inspirational. There's going to be another podcast uh, for the No Plateau podcast that Sabo sponsors where we're going to drill potentially more into the actual medical side and the therapy side of, uh, of Guy and Jane's story. But this is more about people. So... I'm going to tee it up. Uh, Guy, you had a stroke, but you didn't just have one stroke. You had two strokes very quickly together, correct? Yes. And how many years ago? I had in 2016. Okay. In May, I had my own company, a construction company. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I cut my hand on one of my projects sometime in March. Okay. And when I cut my hand, I just bandaged it and went on about the job. Um, about in May of that same year, I basically went blind. Wow. And actually Jane was the one who called, uh, 911. I had, t- I had to do some convincing. <laughs> like, says, like you do with I, most men. Yeah. I, I can't, he thought he had the flu. Oh my word. And obviously we were treating it as the flu. And then he, he was sitting on the edge of the bed. He said, I can't see you. And I said, well, that's a problem. Uh, we need to go to the hospital now. No, 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 no. And we have a service up here called telehealth. Uh-huh. I said, okay, I'm going to call telehealth and we'll see what they say. So you get connected with a medical professional we called and they sent the ambulance. They said, no, he's got to go now. And they sent the ambulance and it was fairly quick because we didn't live too far from from the hospital. And as they got there, his speech started to slur. And that's how I knew for sure that it was a stroke. So it sounds like you, because you acted quickly, you were able to get him to the hospital as this thing was kind of happening. Absolutely. Um, I think an important thing to remember there is it, it. there are a lot of reasons to have a stroke. There's a lot of causes for a stroke. But you had this massive infection, right? That that is that what led to the stroke? Is that what caused it originally? Well, what happened was that I was diagnosed with a heart murmur back in my mm-hmm. early twenties during a routine physical. Sure. And the doctor told me a list of things to watch out for. Okay. He said, "Watch out if you feel sick, you feel lightheaded, if you feel like you had the flu, be very, very careful, because the infection will set in the heart valve." So what I did, he said, you, so I said, so what does, does this mean for me? And he said, well, before you go to the dentist, take your amoxicillin, uh, uh, the, you know, anti-infection, five pills before, one hour before, five pills after. Other than that, I went on to live my life. Wow. Wow. And so you're in construction, living a pretty physically yeah. vibrant life, and uh, you didn't you didn't think anything of it when you cut your finger that that would be something to pay attention to? No, I cut my hand and never thought any more than that. I banished it, and it would always break open every day for about a month, and oh. I would just re-bandage it. And... Well, I, I would see it. I said, this doesn't look right. Just the look of it and the fact that it hadn't healed. I said, this doesn't look right to me. You need to see somebody. And, you know, nah, I've cut my hands for years. <laughs> I spent my whole life hunting and fishing, and as I say, I cut my hands. I, you ever like everyone? I feel you feel sick during the day. You don't take any of it. You just yeah. want about your day. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that for a minute. I know that uh, well, construction's um, I call it God's gym, right? You're outside working, you're doing, you're lifting, bending, moving, and you're just on your feet all day long. But in addition to this, guy, you were pretty adamant about working out and pretty disciplined. Show, tell us what you did before uh, before the stroke. Well, before my stroke, I would get up at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. I'd eat my breakfast. I'd have six eggs, spoonful of peanut butter, go through the door, go to the local pool, 
I do 40 laps without stopping, mm -hmm. which is basically two kilometers. Yeah. Or 1.6 miles, about eight, about four or five, two, two and a little over two miles without stopping. And I would do that every day, five days a week, sometimes on the weekend if I got bored. And during the day, while I was doing construction, every hour an alarm would go off my phone. I would get down and do as many push-ups as I could to stay in shape. So I think that probably had so much of your body and your mind in such good shape that when the stroke happened, you were probably better equipped to handle it than most people would be, even though there was tremendous, tre tremendous damage to your heart. So um, the infection got to your heart. And, and that was one of the triggers. Um, tell us about what happened next. You got to the hospital, Jane, you know, what was their, what was their reaction when they, when, when you guys showed up? I guess they did some tests, you know, they kept him in for observation cause it was around 11 o'clock at night. It was fairly late at night when sure. we went. So, um, they kept him in for observation and then, you know, but I guess, you know, when they did the test, they realized there was something else going on and they didn't quite understand it. So when they admitted him and they put him in a, a room that was um, kind of a sterile room. So you had to have yep. PPE yep. to go in and out of that room. Sure. And because we weren't married at the time, I, w I mean, nobody really was sharing anything with me. Oh, because. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they did surgery. Um, they did surgery. It's a, it's a fairly well, long surgery to replace your heart valve, correct? Right. It took a while to get there. It took about a week, I guess, because it didn't, it, you know, there was something wrong. They did a spinal tap. They thought it was men, uh, a meningitis. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, if I spread meningitis, you know, have I taken it to work? Have I given it to my kids? And they told us that it was that that's what he had. And then it was, no, no, he doesn't have that. And I guess it wasn't until they sent him to another hospital that had this other equipment and they did uh, some, uh, some imaging that they realized it was, um, you know, um, his heart and then realized it was an infection, right? And that, and that his heart valve needed to be replaced. So this so, was, uh, you were in the hospital the entire time until the surgery? Uh, yeah, he was. Okay, got it. So eight or nine days later, they do a surgery and you flatlined on the table, is that correct? Yeah, uh, they said the surgery would take about two and a half hours to replace the valve. Uh, I think it was nine hours. Because they thought it was a valve replacement only, yeah. not realizing that the infection had gone to the core of his heart. Oh, so and they tried to sew it up, but it didn't, it, it didn't take very well. No, so what happened, when he opened me up, he told me after, I walked in his office a year later, and he said to me, he said, I cannot believe you're still here. Jeez. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, I put thousands of stitches in your heart. He said, whatever I couldn't stitch, I glued. He uh -huh. said, when I would pull the thread, it would pull through the muscle of the heart. He said, if you were older, I would have closed you up and called it a day. And when you're still in the hospital, something else happened. You had another stroke. Well, what happened was that the heart was pumping out emboli. Okay. At first, and it went to my brain. And then it caused me to have a brain bleed. So that's, in a sense, your, your second stroke in, you know, in two weeks. And, um, Gene, you were at the hospital with him at that point, right? And he said he had a headache. I, yeah, he said, I got this headache. Mm -hmm. And so I went and I told the nursing staff, look, he has a headache. I think someone should look at him. Okay. And okay. they said, okay, we'll be there. And then they weren't there when, you know, as quickly as I thought they should be. I went back and I said, look, you know, you really need to see him. Okay, well, we're kind of in the middle of shift change. And, and I'm like, but you got to come. It doesn't matter about your shift change. And I sure. went back into sure. the room. And then, he, and then he started to slur his words. And then I went back out. So now he's having a stroke. And they scrambled. Unbelievable. And, and apparently there was a neurosurgeon on staff who did a CAT scan and then found out what was going on, and then you had some decisions to make, right? Apparently, the doctor said to your son, and to you standing there, Jane, if we don't do anything, he's gone by morning. But if we do do something, it could be pretty catastrophic, so a lot of people regret it because you may not come back the same person. So what, what were you and guys, what were you guys thinking at that point, Jane? 
well, in my mind, I mean, I had never met any of his family, so that was a great introduction. <laughs> oh, my um, word. Oh, you're kidding. That's a whole separate CBS miniseries right there. Um, so I, I didn't feel I had a right to say anything, but I know in my mind, I'm like, I don't know. You know, I don't know what he's willing to live with. I don't know, you know, his feelings on this and just hoping that his son um, you know, would, would have an idea of what his dad would have, would have wanted. Right. And so what did your yeah. son say to the doctor's guy? Well, he basically said, you do what you can for my dad. Well, uh, knowing what I know, if you're a guy that gets up and swims a mile and a half every morning and does pushups during the day and you work in construction, you're like, bring it on. And, and that's well, kind of, it was, you know, it was kind of a thing. Like I remember the neurosurgeon, he was, he was scrubbing up for somebody else downstairs when my, when my bleed happened. Mm -hmm. He said, if I wasn't scrubbing up for you, you would not be here. No kidding. If you scrub up someone else, you would not be here. Jeez. He came up and walked in the room and said, I'll give you one minute to make up your mind. Wow. Do you want to save him or do you want to let him go? Wow. And they found there were three aneurysms at the time? Well, what happened is when they done this, when they done, after they done the surgery, they done, they done another CAT scan and they found three aneurysms. So wow. there was a guy in the hospital, the only one that would do it. He went up through my groin and to my brain and coiled two of the three aneurysms. Oh my the God. last one, the cerebellum, he wouldn't touch. It was too risky. So that's still there? Uh, no, he went back in after the after they had on that procedure. They went back in, done another CAT scan, and they found five. Oh, my word. And they came now, in. After, they went my, after my second surgery, I was in a coma for... Four to six weeks. Jeez. So you, they got him. You've had two strokes in two weeks. You come out of the coma, and uh, you're sitting there with with Jane and, and your family. What's the first thing you thought of, guy, when you when you woke up? They asked me what year it was. Okay. And I thought, what a stupid question. <laughs> and I told them what I thought it was. It wasn't even close. Oh, really? No kidding. So. When you when you woke up, what what were what were the first things that challenged you? Was it speaking? Was it movement? Was it everything? What was the first thing that you thought of? Like, oh my gosh, this isn't working right. Well, I was when I came into coma. I was probably about. They all told me I had a stroke. Okay. They all told me how serious it was. Mm -hmm. But still, I did. I really didn't know. Right. I woke right. up. Jane told me probably maybe ten times. Maybe every day she'd tell me. Because I thought I could just get to bed and go. So I, I woke up one night about, I don't know, in the middle of the night. I realized I couldn't move. Okay. One side of my okay. body, and I panicked. And that was when I realized it. So you woke up at night, realized you can't move. Was it your entire body or just one side? One side, left side. Left side, okay. Um, you know, knowing what I know about your, your kind of... Uh, persona before this did you think i'm screwed or did you think what do i got to do to fix this yeah <laughs> i wasn't thinking much okay you were just it was so jane actually it was jane i mean jane took over from there good okay so jane i was hoping we'd get to that what are you know you've, you've met his family <laughs> for the first time <laughs> right yeah. you're sitting there and what what is it that uh, that inspired you to say, hey, we're going to tackle this? And what was the first thing you said to Guy to help him kind of think through this? Well, I guess it never ever crossed my mind that that he wasn't going to make it, that he wasn't going to have recovery. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess any time I spoke to him, it wasn't like, oh, well, this is where, you know, this is where your deficits are. It was, I mean, he would ask questions because he wasn't, you know, he, he was, there was, you know, there was confusion there. Like I would say, okay, I got to go now. I have to take one of my kids to a soccer game. I'll just go with you. I said, oh, no, no, you got to <laughs> stay in the hospital. You, you know, you can't really go kind of stuff. Not saying you can't go because you can't walk and you can't sure. move, sure. And you, right? It was, no, you're better off here. You you know, he was still hooked up to IVs to fight this infection. It took a long time to get rid of that. It was a cocktail of, of medication. So it, it basically, it was just the attitude that, yeah, this is going to get better and let's not dwell on what you can't do. Mm -hmm. 
let's see what you can do and how we can how we can overcome that like he had left side neglect so i made a, a conscious effort to sit on the left side to make him look at me and then i would put stickies on on the on that side and say can you find this number or that number um, he didn't know what day it was and when he was in the hospital there was only two days a week he could have a shower but if you didn't ask and they got busy you didn't get a shower so sure. there was there was like a calendar of stickies on right in front of him and big arrow like sh on the shower days right so jane did you have any prior training to think of those things i mean what no nope. so well you a mother of four and Correct. my kids have learning disabilities, right? ADD and learning disabilities, working memory problems. So okay. Um, okay. maybe that was my training. <laughs> How old were your kids at the time this uh, this happened? Um, oh, goodness. So I guess Soren was, what, maybe 12, um, 14, uh, 16, and 19. So you're trying to manage a household with four teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you got a fifth teenager in the hospital. Yep. <laughs> I wouldn't quit count me a teenager at that point. I was probably like a 10 year old. <laughs> like a 10 year old. I was high maintenance. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's such an important thing. And, and, and I know when you get on the, uh, the no plateau podcast, the fact that you sat on the affected side is so different than what a lot of people do. A lot of people would would, would go to the, the non-affected side and just leverage everything there. But you were smart enough to say, hey, if I get over here, I can start to reintroduce some training and some learning in these post-its. What a great suggestion. When you look at the first few weeks where you were like, I'll just go to soccer practice with you. And she's like, well, no, I've got it covered. What are you thinking at that point about um, your first goal? What's the first thing you said yourself that you want to be able to do uh, that started the recovery? Well, I back up a little bit. When I came in a heart surgery, mm -hmm. the first thing I did was looked at Jane and said, will you marry me? Oh, well, there's an important part of the story you left out. <laughs> I missed it. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> I asked the first question. Now, she said she thought I was, no, she can take it from here. I thought, well, he's high um, <laughs> on drugs. So we won't mention that ever again. <laughs> oh, my God, that's amazing. So she never mentioned it. So when I they put me in CCU because they're waiting for long term care room for mm -hmm. me. So they put me in CCU and told my family, listen, this is probably as good as he gets. And I was in the bed curled up in a ball. My brother said, man, he's 49 years old. So she and my family didn't know anything about proposal. Nobody did. So I asked her to marry me. Then I would keep asking her. I said, I asked you to marry me. You never answered me. And she, I just thought it was drugs. I never said anything. <laughs> but so anyway, she finally, she said, I will marry you when you can dance with me to our wedding. And I said, deal. That was on June 24, 2016. Wow. I was in CCU with feeding tube in my nose and in a wheelchair. Wow. And wow. little help, ever, I hope ever get me out. So June 16th, and one year, exactly one year later, we got married at an outdoor wedding, and I danced for her at a wedding on June 24, 2017. That wasn't planned. It just happened that way. Wow. Okay, so I wasn't kidding when I said this is a CBS miniseries right now. This is, a, this is like the movie of the week. Um, you can't make that stuff up. And so, all right, within a year, you were dancing at your wedding. When you think back about your your time in construction, you've got. To, did you put your company on hold during this period of time? How, what happened there? Uh, basically, what I done, I put it on hold or shut it down. Okay, you did. Okay, got it. And are you? Is the company back up and running? What are you doing today, other than inspiring? Do you, I think this is what I want to drill into. You, we're going to come back to your 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 recovery in a year, but since then you've. You've got a business now to inspire and help other stroke victims. Tell us about that. Well, the thing I think that when I, while I was in a coma, Jane would <clears throat> drive 10 minutes to the hospital. She had an hour for lunch. She would drive 10 minutes to the hospital and sit with me for 30 minutes, drive and then drive 10 minutes back every lunchtime. 
And what, what did you? What were you doing, Jane? What do you do? What were you doing for a living? What was your job? Uh, so working for an IT distributor, okay. I was a business okay. development manager for um, hard drives for a company called Seagate. Yeah, Seagate. I know Seagate well. So you're run. You're working full time. <laughs> You're, yep. you're handling four teenagers. You've got this 10 year old yep. at the hospital. You're trying to spend lunch with them. He just asked you to marry him. Probably the most romantic proposal in the history of mankind because you're curled up in the ball with a feeding tube. I could just imagine how sexy that was, Jane. You're we like, have yes. pictures. Yeah, you just jumped into his arms and that was it, right off into the sunset. Okay. Yep. So um, uh, fast forward to today. What are you two doing now to help other stroke victims and stro- stroke survivors kind of get through these difficult times? What is it that you guys do? Well, we've learned a lot since then. I mean, mm-hmm. you only learn about stroke after you had one, really. Right. Seriously. Right. I mean, my grandfather had a stroke at 69. I just know he staggered around. He never had much, back then, never had much rehab. Mm-hmm. So he basically just hobbled around and he couldn't talk. That's all I know of my grandfather. Okay. But so what we wanted to do is we took the construction company, which was JGH, which stood for my name, okay. Jeffrey Guy Harvey. Renovation and Construction Company Limited. And okay. we changed it to JGH, which stands for Jane and Guy Harvey. Okay. Rehabilitation okay. and Consulting Services. Okay. But, and uh, specializing in stroke rehab. So how does the business work? How, uh, what kind of, uh, are you providing products, services, motivation? Uh, what, is it, what does the day in the life look like for the two of you? Well, Jane live, works on one side of the, the living room, which we are now. And I work on the other side. She works from home. I work from home. I talk to stroke survivors, uh, hospitals, clinics, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and I basically am an importer distributor for Sable. And uh, so, Jane, you're no longer working at Seagate. This is your full-time role now as well? No, no. I I have a full-time role uh, with a company called Legrand AV. Okay. um, Okay. Providers of um, AV solutions, complete Mm -hmm. AV solutions to... um, AV dealers, uh, we sell through distribution and direct marketing retailers. So that's what I do. I'm a national sales manager for them. Okay, great. And I am um, the number one employee at. Uh, <laughs> she Jane. got employee of the year life. <laughs> you know, when you when you think about helping other stroke victims, what's the so someone who's come out of. Um, out of the emergency room, they've, they've recovered from the stroke, or they, I should say they survived the stroke, and they're ready for that first inpatient visit for therapy. What's the first thing you would tell them about the journey they're about to begin? It's tough. It's a, it's a never-ending. I've been I've been six years anniversary now in May. I'm May the 2nd, and it I don't think it ever ends. I think it's just a series of events that goes through, and you improve, and then you change up. You improve, you change. And it's always change. As you improve, you change your routine. I think the frustrating thing for survivors is they don't see the tiny little steps. Mm. They, I mean, at the beginning, you see they, they recognize the bigger steps, right? Because they're not able to do anything. And all of a sudden, they're doing big, bigger steps. They weren't able to walk. And now they're able to walk with aid. And then they're able to walk with just a cane. And then they're able to walk. And they have balance. And they see those big things. But... As time goes on, there's smaller little pieces of that puzzle that fit together, but they're not recognizing that. And when they don't recognize it, they think they're not progressing. And I think it's important to hear, like, when a guy goes walking, there are people stop him. I saw you walking last year. You're walking so much better. And he was thinking he wasn't. Uh, so oh. they have to look at the tiny pieces or just because they can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Got it. That's great advice. That's great advice. But the thing is, Pete, is that you will be the last one to see your progress because mm. you're dealing with it every day. Sure. So when I see someone I haven't seen for months or a year, especially in the beginning, like they were just flabbergasted. They said, I cannot believe that's you. How do you feel today, um, you know, compared to where you were before the stroke physically? Are you 40 percent, 50 percent, 70 percent, 80 percent? Where do you feel like you are today? Well, I am probably... 40% of where I was. Okay. I'm back to uh, hunting with a lot of assistance and doing some fishing with a lot of assistance and okay. assistive okay. devices. And, but I mean, I, I get in the water now and I sink like a stone. <laughs> okay. What I did, what I found about walking was that 
we went down to Florida for a vacation on our honeymoon. Okay. And I would walk in the pool in the low end. Okay. And that's where I really learned to walk. Got it. He would say, why is my foot floating? I said, because you're not putting enough weight. Like, you're not, your weight isn't evenly distributed. Sure. And he would say, yeah, it is. Well, if it was, your foot wouldn't float, right? Which is so difficult because you can't tell yet, right? I mean, it's such a, right. such a new sensation. And by the way, aquatic therapy is so good, as you described, right? Um, yeah. And it's, and it's a great place to learn to walk again. So, Jane, I'm going to go back to you for a minute. You, you guys get married a year later. Uh, you've hit that big goal where... where Guy could dance with you at the wedding. But now, obviously, here you are six years later. You're at 40% of where you were, Guy. And I think a lot of people probably would be back to 70% because my guess is your, your your threshold was a little higher because of what you were doing before you had the stroke. How do you guys approach each day when you think about... Because I'll go back to your point. It's the tiny pieces that people miss. But over a six-year period, that's all, you really have to maintain the energy and the motivation and the excitement to continue this journey together. How do you approach that every day, Jane? Well, I mean, a guy just has that mindset. He's independent. He gets up and he he spends time. He has a, a wedge and he spends time on his wedge to stretch out his um, ankle to keep that range of motion. He'll come down and, and we'll have breakfast together and we'll, he'll do some work. And then he gets on a device called an Exinflex, which pedals for you, but it helps again sure. with his range sure. of motion and it helps loosens all of all of the things, all of that spasticity that he has it helps loosen that that he no longer has to have botox in his lower body and motion means lotion yeah uh, motion is lotion yeah. motion is lotion yeah. and so in the winter time he leaves the x and flex and goes to the recumbent bike okay um in the summertime he goes on his walks so he's always doing something always you know and before before he was even there at, at that point he had a list of things he would do uh, and actually cross them off. And, you know, it was balance exercise, squats, all sorts of things. He He's played like Wii Sports, <laughs> you know, again, for the balance. And Nintendo DS for the eyesight. Eyesight, right, to work on his eyesight. Ah, got it. Puzzles, children's puzzles when he, you know, first came out because he was looking at a very small view of things with that left side neglect. And, I, you know, uh, it was kind of like a tunnel vision he had. And so we got these children's puzzles, the 25 piece puzzles, yeah. so nice big pieces. And he would take that one piece and he would place it around the table. <laughs> and I would say, look at the box. It's part of, it's a small piece of the big picture. And he would get so frustrated at me when I was trying to help him <laughs> see the big picture. But it was really hard for me to watch him. And I'm like, he was never going to get this puzzle finished with that one piece when he has nothing else around and he's not, he wasn't seeing what he was supposed to, he knew he had a puzzle, but he wasn't seeing it was a small piece of that picture sure. that he had to build on. So there's a, there's a couple important things there. I, I asked you, Jane, and, and how you approached the day to day. And the first thing you responded with was that, that uh, guy has the mindset. Absolutely. Right? And I think that's so important. My father-in-law had a, a, a rare condition called syringomelia, which he, he basically, there were similar symptoms to MS. Eventually, he went from being a very vibrant person to a cane to a walker and then a wheelchair. And watching he and my mother-in-law interact there, and, and again, his, his condition was somewhat degenerative, and then they had a surgery, which kind of stopped the progression. But he never came out of the surgery, and he was 70 years old, never was able to come out of that surgery and recover. So um, I, I think when you look across at someone you care about and love, if they're making the effort and they're determined and they're doing the work, I have to think that makes it easier for you to be there and be supportive and encouraging when you see a, a reciprocal effort, right? If you're doing all the motivating and encouraging and, and guys not engaged, it would, ha it would be very difficult, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely, because eventually you yeah. would stop. It's like then you become an egg. It's like I'm, I'm trying to motivate you. I'm trying to help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remember doing that with, you know, kids and homework, sure. right? I'm here to help you. I'm going to sit beside you. Let's get this done. I don't want to do it, you know? Sure. And it's like, you can only, and then it's like, if you, I can't make you do it. If you don't have the desire, even though it's the right thing to do is your homework. And I'm, you know, yeah. I'm here so to true. help you. So but true. if you're not going to do it, I can't do it for you. And it makes you very, as, as you know, the parent or the caregiver would make you yeah. very, you know, helpless. Yep. So I think, and then um, you know, helpless and then frustrated, for, right? 
by the way, for anybody listening to this program, and, and again, my program is kind of targeted for leaders or entrepreneurs, people that run businesses. There is a very salient takeaway here that it can apply to anything in life, whether you're recovering from a stroke or trying to accomplish a task. The fact that you wrote down these checklists, Guy, of things you wanted to accomplish and then check them off. I know that's the way my, my brain kind of works. If I'm doing a workout and I want to do 10 sets, I write down one through 10 and I check them off as I do them. Okay. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a sense of accomplishment. Every time you do it, I put yeah. it on my fridge. Everything exercise I would do, I would check it off. Well, and Jane, to your point, I think that's how you get those micro moments, right? Those tiny pieces. You may not see the overall progress, but if you can see you've checked off everything for the day, you know you've made progress. And also, sometimes you might forget he had done them, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like yesterday, he said to me, uh, we didn't have lunch yesterday. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> There's a lot of people like to forget about the lunch they had yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, with me, it's now, and I'm realizing there's holes in, in my memory. Okay. It's, I, I trust her now for everything because sure. uh, I've had probably about five to six seizures in the last few years. Okay. I mean, you haven't had any in the last two. No, I have two. But for a while, I was having a seizure. I lost time. Oh. So she would have to fill it in. Got it. We were walking. We were driving in a car one day, and she pulled him up in the McDonald's parking lot. And I said, what are you doing here? Tell the story. So we were, we were, I was out um, actually visiting some customers a little bit away from home. And uh, I thought, well, guy might have fun just getting out of the house, right, sure. rather than being home by himself. So he went with me. He would wait in the car while I would do, would do my thing. And, I, you know, he said, I'm hungry. Can we go to McDonald's? Absolutely. And that's right around the time we were planning the wedding because you had a conversation about that. And so I pull into the parking lot and he goes, why are we here? I said, you said you were hungry. I want McDonald's. I don't want McDonald's. I never said that. I thought, okay, all right, that's kind of weird. Sure. And then I mean, something else came up and he didn't remember. And he got a phone call about his wedding ring, right? Uh -huh. And, you know, and then I said, do you, you got a phone call. Do you remember, like, just a few minutes ago, do you remember that? No, I didn't get a phone call. And I started asking, like, do you remember? So I went backwards, trying to figure out what, what was the last thing he remembered. Okay. And there was about 15 or 20 minutes that he didn't remember. And that was concerning. So we ended up going to see his doctor just to make sure it wasn't some sort of, you know, something happening within his brain that lead to something uh, more catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And they turned out to be seizures, you said? Yeah, I think uh, we, we came back to that. Yeah, it might have just been a seizure. Got it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had and when he would have the seizures, you know, I would say, OK, you, you just had a seizure. I did not. <laughs> like he wouldn't even, he wouldn't remember it, and I'm I'm trying to think like what do you remember? Because I would time them right and to see if he remembered stuff going into it, and sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. Sure. As we adjusted the medication, as you know, his neurologist adjusted the medication, he could feel them coming on. And then he goes, "Oh, I'm going to have a seizure," and then he would go to his little little seizure place, and then there would be <laughs> some that I'm going to have a seizure. Got it. And I would be talking to him and I'd be saying, okay, so don't go there, right? Try not to go to that seizure place and, you know, just talk to me. And he, he could hear me, whereas before he couldn't hear me. Okay, got it. And then it, he would actually be able to talk to me, but he would still be in the seizure. Wow, that's amazing. And he that's would, re amazing. then it came to the point that he would remember everything during the seizure and knew he had the seizure. Wow. So My neurologist was so amazed, amazed at the whole thing that he said, film that for me, tape it. He said, record it and bring it to me. I said, you're not recording that. And I said, oh, yes, I am. If when it happens, I'll record it. So have you been able to record one? No. And he, no, and we're not showing it. And, we're, and, and luckily, knock on one, luckily, he hasn't had any for Good. a few years. So that's great. That's the news. That's the news I wanted to hear for sure. Yeah. So, you know, moving forward, um, you know, Guy, what's your vision for, you know, the company you're now involved with and in, in helping therapists and patients? Where do you see that headed? Well, we're we've expanded now with Stable we're taking on a bigger role. We go to uh, lunch and learns with rehab facilities, and they love to see the perspective from a stroke survivor sure. and a caregiver. So what it does me, we tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure. And we bring the products with them, with us. It's not, you know, you can see a product on a screen. You can see a product on a piece of paper. But to actually 
touch it as as somebody who who is a therapist, physiotherapist. Sure. It's a huge difference. It just makes you think, yes, th- I get it now. I can see how this can help my patient. Look what it's done for this man right in front of me, right? Because mm-hmm. when Guy was in, in the hospital, I noticed his arm up here, but starting to twist, like naturally just sitting there. At rel- and I went, oh, that's not, that's not normal. Sure. I just started stretching his hand and his arm on my own because I thought, okay, because I I guess when I, when I touched it, it was obviously stiffer than normal. So I thought, okay, so I need to stretch that. I need to manipulate it. I need to keep that. So it doesn't end up because, you know, you see people with their hands twisted and and clenched um, because he didn't have a brace. He didn't have anything. And that's kind of, where I went, I went and I said, how do you, you know, Google, um, they call me Google here. Yep. How do you help somebody with um, uh, issues with the arm after stroke kind sure. of thing and, sure. and doing a lot of research and nobody said sit there and stretch the hand, but it was to understand that yes, the hand was getting tight, but that's where I first heard of the Sable product. I'm going, I don't know who these, I don't know who this is. I don't know. Cause there's a lot of products out sure. there. You get a lot of crazy stuff from China. It's like, okay, I don't want to buy anything that might hurt him. Right. right? And that so I le- I left it, but when he went to um, rehab, the stroke rehab inpatient clinic, um, they gave him one of those, and it was like, okay, it's a legitimate product. Mm-hmm. It, it is remarkable how the right treatment, both whether it's a product, is also the therapist, or in your situation, Jane, where you recognized, hey, if I manipulate these muscles, I can reduce the spasticity. And all the other things, because it's a combination of having someone with you or, or, you know, touching and moving and getting the device in the right place, in addition to a good quality product. So, yeah. um, you know, what are, the, what are the products or therapies that have had the most impact for you? Probably the biggest thing was the first thing was the stable stretch. Okay. That was, that probably saved my arm, hand and fingers and wrist, because I be see people now with, with their wrists dropped, their fingers distorted. Yeah. And it's. Yeah. And mine is just the same now, the same size it was when I first had a stroke. Got it. So I'm very fortunate there. I use a lot of electric muscle stimulation, EMS, yep. every day. Got it. Yeah, that's ama- those products are amazing. Absolutely amazing. If you were to leave uh, our, our audience with, and, I, and I, this is an important question in my mind, because I think at the heart of, of your journey, your marriage, your recovery, and the path you're on today, what advice do you have for couples dealing with any kind of a traumatic injury or condition or surgery or disease? How have you two gotten through this? What's the secret? Well, I, I think it's personality, actually. Okay. Right? Um, you know, I was very active before I met him and before his stroke, you know, hunting and fishing. And, um, you know, back in Newfoundland, they heat their house by... Uh, wood right wood furnaces so he was out in the winter always cutting down wood and chopping up trees and making firewood and all of that stuff so he was a very active person he has a great sense of humor and that was that was something that that you know we were always laughing in the hospital and i think laughter is great medicine he didn't take himself too seriously and if he was having a bad day and he you know may have had a serious moment um, it was easier. It was easy to snap him out of that. Oh, got it. I think personality helps. I'm a very positive person, and it's not something I I have to try to be. It's just kind of you know I'm always looking for that little ray of sunshine, and I'll go towards that sunshine. Well, I think uh, with her, she's the most positive person I ever met in my life. I knew that the first day I met her. Sure. Support uh, is, is big. Uh, if you've got something going on, I can certainly see why. Guy's first one word answer was Jane. <laughs> Everyone needs a Jane. But everyone needs a Jane. Um, you know, Jane, first of all, uh, thanks so much for joining the podcast. And, and obviously, uh, you're right. I hope everyone that has a stroke or a traumatic situation like this has someone like you in their life who is very positive because I know there are good days and bad days. And you made a really good point. If you're positive, the bad days are easier to snap back out of. Uh, and that's such a solid message to everybody. And the other thing that you said that was subtle, but I think really important, and, and I have a background in health and fitness, I don't necessarily exercise or work out or eat healthy for today. I do it as an investment for tomorrow. And the fact that you were active 
and lived a vigorous life does two things. One, it helped you survive. And two, it gives you the motivation because you know what work is like and you know what it's like to put in those reps. And, and by the way, we didn't talk about it. Everything you're doing requires thousands of reps, doesn't it, guy? Thousands and thousands and thousands. Thousands of reps. So it, I, do, I do probably about three to five hours of rehab a day. Yeah. Still now, six years later. And I would not be where I am now without that. 100%. Uh, and I think a lot of, uh, and we're going to talk about this in the No Plateau podcast. This is going to be a major theme of that, of that episode is a lot of traditional stroke therapies would have left you behind. Right. They would have said, exactly. that's it. You're good. But uh, there are new ways of looking at it. There's new products, new services. By the way, we need to bottle up Jane and be able to sell Jane to every stroke victim because <laughs> I think yeah, you, you can't have money. Yeah, I know. I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. You know, you can have all the greatest technologies and services out there, but if you have somebody by your side who's going to encourage you and be there with you, it's, it's probably more difficult. So I'm very grateful that the two of you took some time to share this with our listeners, and I look forward to being part of your journey going forward. Well, thank you. We do do. No. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video.